Namaskar everyone and welcome. Thank you for joining us on this beautiful Sunday afternoon. While we wait for people to join, we're just going to do uh, a few brief polls to get some feedback from you. So namaste once again and welcome. Uh, my name is Manisha Gutman. I'm part of a group called EcoExist. We're based in Pune. We have been working on issues of sustainability for the past 16 years. And uh, this particular series, this the Revive web series started during the COVID lockdown. Um, and initially it began just as a group of friends wanting to share their work and also learn from each other and slowly it's been organically growing. Uh, so we, before I actually introduce, we've got some amazing guests with us and we also have a great speaker. But before I get to that, we'd like to do one more poll just to check in with you and see what kind of topics you would be interested in hearing about so that we can plan the future sessions. So if you can just, Give us your feedback on this poll, that'll be great. For those of you who've just joined, we're just finishing up uh, 
a poll and we'll start in a few minutes. So if you don't hear anything, just bear with us. Namaste, everyone. I am so happy to welcome today uh, an amazing group of people, mainly here to welcome Bablu Ganguly, who's joining us live from Timbuktu, which is an actual place in Andhra Pradesh, <laughs> a place that they named Timbuktu. Bablu Ganguly is the founder of a, a collective called the Timbuktu Collective. Uh, which is reaching out to 182 uh, villages in uh, Andhra Pradesh, and it is impacting around 25,000 marginalized family. So we are really, really honored to have Bablu Ganguly here with us. He's going to talk to us about how the Timbuktu Collective came together and also share with us his own journey, his own learnings. And to host him along with me, we have uh, a few other people who some of us know, some of them know Bablu and some of them are working in the same field as he is in the field of ecological restoration in the field of organic farming. We have with us Ketki and Mansi from Oikos, which is a group based in Pune. We also have with us uh, Walter Mendonza who's based in Pune, who has spent sev several years in Timbuktu with Bablu, so he knows him personally. And we have Sunita Rao here with us from, she's in Bangalore right now, but she's actually, nice. yes, she's actually based in a place called Shirsi in uh, Karnataka. And she has been running an organic uh, farm forest and has also created uh, an amazing collective of women uh, farmers called Banastri. So today's discussion uh, is going to be about Bablu and about the Timbuktu Collective. And we all have plenty of questions for you, uh, Bablu. So the way we organize this, because we have, we have a window of two hours, which is a fair amount of time, but with around 200 participants, it's probably going to fall short anyway. So uh, the way we structure this is that we, we give you around an hour to speak. Uh, during which time, if people have questions, we would request you to use the question and answer box that you see on your dashboard and type out your question there. I will be going through, I'll be, I'll be monitoring the questions that come in and trying to compile them together for Bablu as he speaks. And then towards the end of our session, we will open it up so that we can take a few questions from the audience and you can talk to Bablu directly. So uh, we'd request you to kind of keep a, a bit of discipline in terms of chatting. Please don't chat on the chat box. All questions should be uh, put into the Q&A section. So I think with that, welcome everyone again. And over to you, Bablu. And I'm here with your PowerPoint presentation, so we can take it from there. You're on mute, Pablo. I think we have to unmute you. Hang on. Oh, no. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. Yeah. Hello, everybody. I um, uh, I'm not used to this medium, as you will have figured out. Uh, so Manisha actually told me that uh, uh, I'm supposed to just generally chat. Uh, it's like a conversation. So, where do I start, Manisha? I mean, how how do you what do you want me to say first? You want to talk about me? Talk about the collective? Talk about what we do? Well, where are you right? Where are you right now? Can you tell us? Because we can see a beautiful landscape in the background. I'm I'm in Timbuktu. 
and Timbuktu uh, is where? Okay. Um, yeah. Why? Why? Why don't we just start the slideshow so you will get get an idea <laughs> right away? Okay. So you want to start with the PowerPoint right away? We can do that. Yeah. Okay. Just give me one second. <clears throat> Basically, we are in, in, in Andhra Pradesh, uh, just north of Bangalore, about uh, 170 kilometers north of Bangalore, uh, quite near the national highway going towards Hyderabad and then carrying on to Varanasi. And uh, and the airport is just about an hour and a half away. So we are not really in a nowhere, nowhere land. We are quite accessible, but it is remote from habitations. So there you have the first slide. You could go into the slide mode. Yeah. And uh, when we bought the land, about 30, 32 years ago, uh, we, 30 years ago, yeah, we named this place Timbuktu. And that's a long story, but maybe after this show, we can get to that. Yeah, we can go to the next. Next, please. So yeah, to the question where we are located, that's in the India map, that's about it. We are in Andhra Pradesh. And uh, this area actually used to be um, quite a wealthy area. Uh, though we've always been in the rain shadow, rainfall has always been minimal, uh, it's been dry, but the assets, the resources that were created by the rulers at that time uh, was quite fantastic. So we had, had 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 very good forests here. Not the kind of forests most of you will know. This is basically a grassland habitat, and uh, the kind of forests we have here are bush forests. And right now, where we are, Timbuktu, if one was to see from the highway, the Bellari that used to be known as the Bellari Highway. Uh, was considered to be one of the finest uh, deciduous forests in the south. But by the time we came, it was more or less barren <clears throat> and having lost most of it. We can go to the next slide. So this is a summer photograph of uh, Anandpur district. It's very typical. Uh, we had 11% uh, forest area in 1947-48 and uh, today we have less than 1% forest area. So all the tree cover, everything has, has more or less disappeared. Next, please. So, yeah, 30 years ago, we bought this piece of land. It was 32 acres, three of us put together money and uh, we bought this land. We had about 21 species of flora at that time. We can go to the next slide, please. Slowly by, by 95, we had set up a small school and it had started regenerating um, quite fast. Um, we can go to the next one. And this is a, is, is a recent photograph. Uh, so from 21 species of flora in 1991 or 92, when we did our first um, species collection, uh, it has gone to more than 400 species now. And it's, it's all natural. Yeah, so we'll go to the next one. So you have to keep pressing, yeah, one by one. 
so that will tell you the story straight away so today we are working in 183 villages covering working with about 25000 families and uh, <clears throat> one of our strategies has been to basically to organize the people form sangams and then federate those sangams and form cooperatives so the idea being that uh, people must get together and uh, take care of their own lives. Yeah. The next one, please. So these are the interventions on a, a very broad scale. Basically, we are working with six programs. Uh, we are working on ecological restoration. We are working with women. We are working on farming. We are working to enhance the livelihoods of agricultural workers. And uh, we are working with uh, people with disabilities. And then we have gone on to work with children. We go to the next slide. So the first topic that I'll take up is the work that we have done with children. Mostly these are photographs. I'll just briefly tell you, go to the next slide, please. So we started this work in 92, 93, basically trying to fight this violence against uh, children and creating children, children's spaces, basically. Today, we are working on the ecological rights of children. Uh, and uh, there are different age groups we are working with, but we started three programs, basically. One was a school. We used to run actually two schools right up to class 10 which we have now cut down to class five because there are enough schools now for the children. And so we only have a small school here for children who really need our support. And uh, we also have a small program called Mogga uh, where we work with children, uh, youth basically in the villages. And we have a children's resource center that houses, you can go to the next slide that houses um, a library and some computers and where children of the village can come and, uh, and generally do whatever they want to do or get any kind of support that they want. And we are starting these resource centers in the villages also. We've started three more resource centers in the villages. So we do kind of workshops with the children. You can change the slide. And there's a lot of fun games, etc. theater that takes place. We work with about 2,000 children in about 45 villages. <clears throat> you can go to the next slide. Uh, the next thing is Kalpavalli. This is basically a community managed uh, biodiversity area that we've been, again, protecting from 92, 93. You can go to the next. next. So there is a there's a tank, you know, tanks. Um, they, these are water harvesting structures that were created four or 500 years ago um, by the rulers at that time. They are pretty huge, anywhere from uh, 20 acres to 400, 500 acres in size. So the tank that you see there on this slide, the blue colored one, is about 425 acres in size and gives water to about 600 acres of land. And the space that you see marked in red, I mean, that whole area above the tank is the watershed of the tank. And we have been working with the people of about seven, eight villages, uh, protecting that piece of land. The total piece of land that is now being protected is about 9,000 acres. But this one that is marked in red is about 7,000 acres. And this is one huge contiguous area. You can go to the next slide, please. And uh, this is a photograph of the area in 1995-96. To the next uh, slide. Wow. And this is in 2014. It's almost the same place where that earlier photograph, and this is in 2016. So this is, I mean, of course we've
of the land is also just pure grasses. And this is a grassland ecology within which certain kind of bush trees grow. <clears throat> yeah, we go to the next one. So lots of birds have come back. The wolf has come back. And go to the next deer, I'll come back there. So it's a wilderness uh, creating a habitat for the uh, wildlife in the area. You know, the Indian gray wolf is a is, is a dying animal uh, with only about uh, 500 odd animals in the Karnataka biosphere and maybe about 3,000 or 5,000 of them in the country. So this has become their, their area of denning, which is a very important uh, turn of events. Can we go to the next? And this is, of course, the next slide that you'll see is, on the, is a black buck. The black buck is our state animal and uh, one that is least protected. But here they have found a sanctuary and there are many of them in this place. Yeah, we go to the next slide. So in the next slide, I come back to the, the first slide. And this is basically to tell you that we've also been working on the tanks. So uh, the Mushtikoila tank that you see, the blue colored one is one. And then on the, the other side of the watershed, there is uh, the Kogira tank. So we worked on these two tanks uh, for a number of years. You can go to the next slide. You'll see that this is the state of those tanks, you know, we have about 300 such tanks in Anantpur district alone. And if we were to revitalize these tanks, then I think half the problems of this area would be, um, would be resolved. So these tanks have gotten completely silted up. As you can see the hills on the, on the background, they're completely bare and they have been doing agriculture on the, on the, on the, on the, on the other side of the tank and it has all all stuff is is all the soil has been coming into the tank so this is a, the photograph of the tank in post monsoon as you can see it's a huge tank and the hill uh, the the village is just nestled between the tank and the um, the water uh, the, the agricultural area which is to the right which is about 600 acres of land. So we were trying to desilk the land, but of course this is a huge thing. So we basically proposed to the government that look, you can do this kind of work, give them a proposal. And um, since then they have been planning to do something about it. We go to the next slide and this is really about our flagship program. This is the work that we do with uh, women. Uh, you can go to the next slide and keep um, pressing the button. So that's the basically the timeline. We started the first cooperative in 1998 and then went on to register four more cooperatives and federated them all into the Mahasakti Federation. And so all together, uh, they are about 23,000 uh, women who are members of this, these cooperatives. You can go to the next slide. So basically, the, the work of these cooperatives is uh, to work like an alternative bank. Uh, the women save money in this, and then they take... Uh, loans from this for various livelihood activities. And of course, they fight for their rights. <laughs> um, so totally, their the, the total capital today is about 33 crores. It's all their own money. And this last year, their whole loan portfolio was about 29 crores uh, for 1919-20. You can go to the next. So they have built their own offices and uh, they have their own offices, they have their own staff, they are completely uh, independent. They, their own savings is about 
27 crores. And it is with this money that they run a banking operation. Yeah, next. Yeah, this is slow. Yeah, like I said, they are completely now self-sufficient. They run independently. We have only one person who works uh, with all the four cooperatives, uh, who is paid by the Timbuktu Collective, and the rest, of course, is paid by the cooperatives. Yeah. Next. Uh, then we have what's known as the Bhavani Chainetta Sangam, and that's a, a group of women who have been uh, weaving. They are, uh, they are not traditional weavers, but who we brought together and uh, they have been weaving. They're a group of young girls. Next slide, please. <clears throat> uh, you can go to the next. So basically, it started as a livelihood initiative, and they have been making these beautiful uh, saris and yardage uh, uh, from Khadi yarn. Yeah, next. They also do natural dyes, and uh, the whole process of weaving is done in this one place. Uh, they make really excellent stuff. Yeah, you can go to the next. So yeah, these are the different products um, that they make. The, the, the woman in the red is my older daughter. She has been doing all the design work with them and the rest are all weavers themselves. Next. So there's this old man who was a silk weaver actually. He was the only man who finally accepted that he would uh, come and teach these young women uh, how to weave because they don't belong to the weaving community. And, uh, and they are women because women are not actually supposed to weave here. It's the men who do the weaving and the women who do the, the, you know, the other work. But then we got these women together and they learned how to weave. They do the whole process, bobbing, yarding, everything, dyeing. And uh, they were trained for many of these things by Dastakar Andhra, an organization in, in, uh, out of working out of Hyderabad. And they run this soon. Hopefully, we will form a cooperative, some of their products. You can go to the next. And then we started the farmers cooperative. This was, we started experimenting on organic farming sometime in 97, 98. And then by the time we actually started working with the farmers was in 2005, six, you can go to the next slide and, and the next. And today we are working with about 2,100 farmers um, in this area uh, with uh, almost 12,000 acres of land. So these are all smallholder farmers, um, most of them having land up to five to seven acres uh, with, all, with about seven or eight percent of them owning up to 15 acres of land. But 15 acres of land in Anandpur district is a smallholder farmer. Uh, we've been trying to promote millets. Uh, the traditional crop, I mean, the conventional crop here had become uh, groundnut uh, from because the government started support, supporting groundnut, promoting groundnuts. And so they grew monocrops of groundnut here. And uh, we have been trying to change that to go back to millets. And today I must say that we've succeeded in, in moving quite a few out of the, out of, of millets. Yeah. Next one, please. So the, the Dharni cooperative also does everything right from seed to the final product. 
and uh, they run a they have a processing unit a value addition unit they have a packaging unit and uh, the product that comes to you it can go to the next is comes out in the brand name of timbuktu organic uh, <clears throat> and uh, uh, you know it's supposed to be one of the cleanest next please uh, products that's available in the market so basically we have about 251 retailers through whom uh, we sell the products they are all pgs certified because in principle we don't want to go for third party certification and there is ready to cook ready to eat uh, products there is peanut oil probably one of the best in south india it's all cold pressed oil and of course uh, there are eight varieties of millets uh, uh, that we try to bring together yeah next so yeah so the, the the products are actually you know everything is bought from the market from the farmers house so the farmer exactly knows how much is being weighed etc and they are members of course so so they have the right over this the total share capital today is i think about 77 lakhs share capital and deposits of the farmer into the whole uh, business <clears throat> you can keep going to the next the assets that they have is worth about 2.5 crores and go to the next so this is the next slide is is actually one of the most important slides about dragni is the the fact that we are trying to give as much back to the farmer member as possible if you go from the right slide to the to the left you'll see if we pay if the customer pays 100 rupees for a kilo of uh, foxtail millet rice then 50 rupees at least 52 rupees goes back to the farmer uh, from that 100 rupees uh, the retailers need anywhere from 25 to 30 percent and then the cost of dharini is uh, running and so 50 percent goes back to the farmers and which is something that's very rare very few cooperatives have been able to maintain that but we hope that we will be able to maintain that go to the next slide so we have a good consumer market and we estimate that you can go to the next that about 45000 people eat the timbuktu organic products and uh, for dharni for 2019 20 uh, crossed about 4.4 crores so it's it's quite a successful uh business enterprise you can go to the next slide and we have been trying to you know get some recipes out because many people have forgotten how to how to cook some of the food uh, that we that we supply to them and you can go to the next slide the prices of timbuktu organic are possibly one of the lowest in the organic uh, section in the organic stores yeah. <clears throat> next please the last of our programs uh, oh no the second last i think is gramsri this is our work with agricultural laborers you can keep going to the next just keep going we started this sometime in 2008 and basically to work only with people who do not have land or have very bad land that cannot be used for agriculture. You can go to the next. And then in 2010, we formed the cooperative and uh, there are now about 880 members in 53 villages with about totally about 10,000 odd small ruminants with them. They keep buying and selling, buying and selling. So the total share capital at their command is about about a crore, and uh, the, the two almost two crores actually, and um, with that they they run this operation. So it, they provide loans to their members, and they they who who buy uh, sheep and goat and sell them. They grow them for a few months, and then they sell them in the market to get a better 
profit. Yeah. I mean, there are small videos about all this in YouTube, so you can get a much better idea when you, when you go through this. We also started a small uh, mutton shop, fresh mutton shop, which ran for about a year. You can go to the next slide. And uh, it ran for a year, but then we, it, it actually did quite well. But we were unable to keep the momentum going. And so we closed it down and hoped we can restart it at some point in time. Next is our work with uh, disabilities. And it's called Milita, <clears throat> which means inclusion. Basically working towards advancing uh, the rights and of, of people with disabilities. Yeah, please go to the next. So this started in 2004 and uh, basically trying to enhance the financial status of persons with disabilities and also doing rehabilitation, therapy and advocacy work along with them. So we formed a cooperative of people with uh, disabilities and it's called the Pratibha Cooperative. Yeah, you can go to the next slide. And uh, now they're working with, uh, they're doing rehabilitation and therapy work with 133 children. We have therapists who go to the houses uh, of, the, of the children and they work with the children every day. But they also have, you can go keep going to the next slide. They also have, we have set up these early intervention centers. You can go to the next slide. So this is mainly for the kids to come and stay the whole day uh, when parents are unable to, because if both the um, parents are working, then they need some place for the kids to be or the kids need some special attention because we have therapists working there. So these centers are there. So the financials of uh, Pratibha Cooperative, again, is pretty interesting. They run a thrift cooperative of their own. They have about 1.1 1. Uh, 1 crores of loans that they have issued in 19, 19 20. And they have a capital base of about 147, uh, 1.47 crores uh, in their bank. So we've started a couple of uh, also livelihood projects and with the people with disabilities, we started in 2014, 15, some work um, on, on making soaps. So these are really lovely slow soaps that they make. You can go to the next slide. And uh, again, there is a short to video of this on YouTube, which you can see. Uh, that they have been making these soaps, which we sell through the Timbuktu or uh, shop that we have on the highway. They make not only soaps, but all other like washing soaps and clothes soaps and hair oils and, and things like that. Doing pretty well, actually. Totally, they have achieved the sales of 23 lakhs totally. And hopefully we will make a soap makers cooperative in the near future. Um, but the market for this is really expanding because in the villages, they want these soaps. Now, this next slide is too complex. You know, it just talks about all the different organizations that the collective has set up. We can go to the next slide. And what you can actually see is that uh, all the cooperatives together have a pretty large financial uh, strength they have about 40 crores of rupees uh, in in the cooperatives which which again they used as their own capital investment so they borrow from each other when they need capital uh, to start off any any livelihood project or any business enterprise uh, this is all their own money it is owned by them and it is in their organizations yeah so we go to the next one, the almost the last slide. We started a shop. It's called the Timbuktu shop. Uh, we said, okay, we are doing everything with the retailers. Uh, maybe we should start our own shop. And so we started this shop in 2018, right near in, in the village that we started working in uh, originally. 
So all these three brands, one is the Timbuktu Organic, the other is Timbuktu Weaves, which is the cloth and yardage, and the handcrafted soaps uh, are sold through here. Recently, there's another group that makes pickles has joined into that group. We also have the Honey Hunters uh, uh, group that has been selling wild honey, basically Floria honey, extremely good honey that comes from this. So the response is phenomenal and we have very good sales. So 1.86 crores in uh, 2018, from between 2018 and 20, we have so far made sales of about one point, about two crores. And the last venture that we have started is a small school. It's a school of agriculture that we have started in a, a piece of land about 20 kilometers south of here. Um, we have now 17 students who are being trained. We are doing a whole one year course on, on agriculture, organic agriculture with using permaculture, biodynamic and organic agriculture as the base. <laughs> yeah, so that's that's about it. The next slide gives you all the information which I think you can get from Manisha anytime. Now, if you can ask me questions, then I can start answering them. <laughs> wow, thank you for that, uh, Bablu. I mean, it's absolutely phenomenal what has been done, what has been achieved, and there are already loads of questions coming in. Uh, I think first thing people want to know is how did you get into this? You know, like, why would you go from Mumbai to Andhra Pradesh? Why did you decide to do something like this? So I think a little bit about yourself here would be good because everybody is Curious, there are some people here who want to start something. So they, I think a little bit about yourself and what kind of, where this whole thing began would be nice. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult to say, it's a long story. But, uh, <clears throat> well, the first thing that I do want to say is that uh, you must understand that this is not my, just my work. Uh, the main person behind this is uh, is Mary, my partner, and without whom uh, all this would not have happened. Because I I talk and I have ideas and uh, I do things, but the person who keeps it going is is Mary. And um, so, other than Mary, there have been numerous, numerous people who have uh, participated in this whole project of ours. Some seen, some unseen, some are still here, some have moved on. Um, but this work, all this that I try to describe is, is the work of a lot of people, uh, both from the area, mainly from this area, and also from, from outside. Now, how did I happen to come here? Okay. Well, I am a Bengali by birth. My parents were born in East Bengal, born and brought up there. My mother from Dhaka, my father from Borishal. And, um, but then when the partition happened, they were already in Calcutta. And uh, so they could not go back. My father was into, into the Quit India movement, was jailed while he was studying his engineering. And uh, he got out of jail when India became independent. And it's very interesting that he applied for, um, to become a policeman. And he passed all the tests, etc. And they rejected him because he had been jailed. Then he applied for, to join the army. And the interesting thing about this is that he came all the way to Bangalore from Calcutta 
to to be uh, to go through the the interview process and uh, he again passed with flying colors but then was told that because he was imprisoned by the british he was not acceptable the irony of our country so actually he came to bangalore many years before i was even thought about and then he got married and then promptly went off to england to do his higher studies in in masters in engineering came back 3 years later and i have a sister uh, who was born just before he left and then with my mother and sister he came to bang uh, to bombay and uh, to to you know to look for a job so i was born in bombay and we lived in santa cruz uh, santa cruz east and i grew up there studied in in a theosophical school and then in manji cooper so i was about 14 by the time i studied for a year in between in a school called st xavier's in hazaribagh which is uh, in jharkhand today and uh, then my father was transferred to bangalore and i came to bangalore all of us came to bangalore studied here in bishop cotton school and then in christ college so those were actually heady days the 70s were very interesting for for india in every which way you know we were beginning to hear things that was happening in the west uh, we were we had the emergency we had fantastic leaders like jay prakash narayan and others who who called for the total revolution we also were were quite anglicized so we studied in all these english speaking schools and and uh, we were influenced by the beatles by by the doors and we were rebels and around the same time you know the the, the we had the the flower movement we had the hippies and we also had israel where kibbutz had started and they were being talked about and of course there was china and the whole soviet bloc so it was a kind of a rebellion the rebellious times and i was part of the students movement in bangalore and uh, then when jayprakash narayan gave the call that uh, we should all leave the universities and move to the to the villages i happened to know an organization that lived like in a commune in this area just nearby it was called the young india project so i happened to know the person who had started it and i said look i'd like to come and join you so he said sure try <laughs> so i landed up on april 1st 1978 to this dry desolate place called penakonda and uh, i had just applied for the ias exams so i was busy preparing for that but i came here to have a look at what these guys were doing they lived in a commune that sounded very good and many of my friends had left the university and had gone to the villages so i said okay let me go and see what these guys are doing fortunately or unfortunately i never went back much to the disappointment of my parents and others and i have been here since so it's about 42 years that's how i landed up here for your question manisha somebody wants to know how old you are so you have to give that away <laughs> oh that's very simple i left home when i was about 21 okay. and i've been working for last 42 years so do your math <laughs> i'm 64 <laughs> okay so the next set of questions bablu is about uh, the community there the villagers how do they welcome you as an outsider 
and then you know how easy or difficult has it been to bring them new ideas uh, you know because most of your work is around organizing them help or helping them to organize themselves so can you talk about uh, you know how you develop this relationship with the community and with the villagers <clears throat> well like i said i've been here from from 78 so that's a long time and yes of course um, you know whatever happens i will still be an outsider but uh, but i uh, we live here we bought land here we are we vote here we are part of the chenkotapalli panchayat and uh, my children are all all telugu speaking telugu uh, i am a bengali my wife and partner is a malayali but our children are telugu so yeah the struggle was actually in 78 79 80 when i did not know telugu uh, i had to learn telugu so one of the most important things if you are asking on behalf of people who want to know is important thing is to 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 learn the language and um, learn the nuances of the language the culture of the area and then become part of it and enjoy being part of it and respect the people you are working with um so in the first 12 years we spent uh, we were basically organizing the people for their rights fighting for their rights and we formed the the unions of agricultural laborers and peasants uh, which possibly had about uh, 300000 members by the time i left and it was across andhra pradesh so i am one of the co-founders of the andhra pradesh agricultural laborers union um which is which which split up and has formed various different uh, groups but we were also the people who originally uh, wrote the first draft of the national rural employment guarantee act in 1985 and uh, so so i mean what i'm trying to say is that i've been working here for so long that when we started timbuktu and the timbuktu collective and um, i actually had decided that i was finished with this and i would just work on the land but mary had not had enough you know she's a trained uh, social worker she said if i am going to be here then i have to do some work with the people and uh, i can't just hang around doing some farm so she went back to the villages and of course the people knew her and she started talking to the women so the first people who we began to interact with were the women of the area and then children because our children were also growing up they were dropouts so then mary picked up some 10 15 young fellows who were also dropouts and we started our first school so how did we get the people to to listen to what we had to say or or be with us and partner us in this whole thing well uh, basically uh, this is this is called building a social building social capital we are known here we are trusted here um there is faith and they know that we are not fly by night we are not coming here for so that's how relationships build and then some people listen some people don't listen some people uh, agree some people don't agree so it just goes on so people also want to know how uh, open the villagers are to new ideas like has your work mainly been about reviving what was already traditionally there and then was lost or you when you when you introduce something new like you were saying you're promoting millets 
when when you bring in new ideas of of farming when you want them to shift into organic farming how open are the villagers to these ideas <clears throat> nothing here that we have done is new and almost all the ideas that i mean all the programs that we have taken up are programs that have been asked for by the people in some way or the other it's a question of of being able to decode what what they are trying to say um so millets is not something new here millets is something that they used to do forever it's only in the 70s the government introduced um groundnut groundnut used to be grown here but i myself in in 40 years ago i have seen massive mixed cropping anywhere from 8 to 13 crops on one plot of land then the government decided that ananpur district was just the right place to grow oil seeds and they started promoting or groundnut and of course they their only idea of agriculture even till today has been the green revolution idea so they started using chemicals in dry land areas in rain fed areas like uh, ananthpur district and of course rapidly destroyed the soil but they also promoted groundnut and they promoted groundnut in a big way so from the spreading variety of groundnut which used to be used they introduced the bunch variety of groundnuts in the 70s along with fertilizer subsidies free seeds etc and by the mid 80s they had already turned this whole place into monocropped groundnut so of this 24 lakh hectares of agricultural land in ananthpur district 20 is under uh, groundnuts so is the largest groundnut growing district in the country and uh, by the 90s the groundnut started failing and actually by 2000 it was on a negative balance that means whatever the farmers planted they wouldn't be able to get back unless and until there was a good rain so when we proposed that we go organic and we try out millets of course there was resistance because a whole generation of farmers know only how to grow groundnut this whole generation of farmers know only how to grow groundnut they don't know how to grow millets but they have a memory of having eaten millets when they were young and there are older farmers you know who are not farming anymore who knew who had some knowledge so we got in touch with some of these people and one of our mentors really were two people one is uh, namalwar from tamil nadu and uh, dr narayan reddy from karnataka these two people were our first teachers and uh, narayan reddy actually went village to village here talking to the farmers and uh, convincing them that that they should move into millets and into organic farming and uh, i mean uh, of course we also kept trying the fact was that we were doing organic farming ourselves so we had uh, demo plots uh, where we could take the farmers and show them how it is done you know whole of timbuktu has been organic for the last 40 uh, 30 years so we have, we don't use organic chemicals in anything so so this is a living kind of example and uh, then we got into it more seriously we we ourselves were doing farming when it came to the women that was way back in 92 93 mary actually went or uh, to the villages and ask them uh, what is it what kind of help do you want they only knew mary as the one who was organizing them into unions and for fighting wage rights and land rights and things like that 
so she said i am not doing that you tell me what is it that you want and they said well what we need is money we don't have any money so mary said ah, how can i give you any money i don't have any money myself so they said it was their suggestion they said you know all these men they get together and they have, they have something known as chitti the chit fund why don't we do that mary said why not let's do that i'll do i'll be your accountant basically and uh, so that's how the women's uh, whole alternative banking thing started um hello yeah what happened am i we can hear you we can hear you your video is coming and going but we we heard you clearly uh, okay so so i'm sorry uh, about the, the video yeah that's okay bablu many people are asking mm -hmm. that uh, is it really possible to replicate this model in other parts of india how do many of them are saying well, how can i create something like this where i am like are there some principles or is there a way that one can replicate or do you believe that you know each each area has to come up with its own solutions well i have never been a uh, i have never been an advocate of uh, of scaling and uh, or an advocate of you know you have a blueprint and you take that blueprint and go and do it in madhya pradesh or something it doesn't work like that you of course need uh, many more bablus and many more marys uh, to to actually replicate and and many more of these local people there what i'm saying is that it's very geo specific it's uh, it happened here because it could happen the same thing may not happen in in jharkhand it may not happen in kashmir uh, but the principles still remain the same if you are ready to go in for a marathon if you are ready to build social capital and if you believe that the earth has phenomenal capacity to regenerate herself if you believe that the people have great capabilities themselves and a lot of wisdom which you can just catalyze into getting out then yeah you'll have many different things the principle basically of is of, of regenerating and reviving and this can be done anywhere in the world and the 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 whole principle of alternative banking that that uh, mary started can be done anywhere in the world it may not be done in exactly the same way we did it but it is the same and uh, yeah <laughs> that's all i can say bablu one of the most impressive things when i was watching your slide show i mean you're saying you're not an advocate of scale but this thing has has really grown and and that's very impressive and the other thing is that that it seems all of it seems to be fairly financially robust so how were you able to uh, make that happen how how were they taught to handle finances how was the financial organization of all these cooperatives did you have mentors for that too was there a trial and error uh, and a learning curve can you share a little bit about that well the first thing is that this is not really a large area we are working within a radius of about 60 square square 60 kilometers so 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 yeah it's a 60 kilometer radius it's it's a it's 183 villages in a very small place it's not like some of these organizations who work in eight districts in 20 states uh, or whatever like that we we are not big that way we are very in a small area working intensively with with a group of people uh that's the first first thing the how intensively can one work and for how many years can one put into into that 
The second part of your question is that most of these seem to be financially robust. Yes, I mean, for at one point we we discovered and decided that really the problem lay in the fact that the village economy had collapsed. It's, the village governance has collapsed. Yeah, and especially in states like Andhra Pradesh. There is no panchayat raj. There is no decision made at the village level. And uh, so village governance has collapsed. Financially, the village economy is in shambles. And we have become, most of the rural areas have become, uh, how do I say, um, the, 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 the place from where the industry, which is more urban, uh, gets all its raw material from. So we have become suppliers of raw material and, uh, and not really producing anything. You know, in 1978, 79, when I came here first, every village had at least at least 10 different occupations right from potters to weavers to washer people to fish fishing people to uh, leather workers to puppet makers uh, you know you name it but today all that the people are doing is either they are farmers or they are agricultural laborers or they are working for the government. So Manisha, people are saying that they can't see me. So what am I to do? My internet that. says it's I'm perfect. I'm just trying to fix that. There we go. I can see you now. Can everyone see him? Please bear with us as long as you can hear his voice because uh, Bablu is in an area where doesn't have very strong internet but Bablu we are also we're able to hear the birds in the background and it's a really beautiful gives us a little bit of taste of, of where you are I think people uh, many people also want to know Bablu what were your challenges did you ever feel like giving up you know uh, like did you did you when you started out did you think it would grow so big or that it would succeed or were there doubts if you can share that side of it also, like how did you overcome those challenges? No. <laughs> we, we, thank you. My sister writes that she's very proud of my our work. Thank you, sister. <laughs> um, Yeah, of course, there have been many challenges, many, many challenges. But then uh, I think we had decided in ourselves that we were going to stay here. And this is all that we know. I mean, for 40 years, this is what we've been doing. And um, so, so the challenges have been there. Yes, there have been people who have tried to dissuade us from working, the politicians have been, the people in power have done it, uh, the, the, the bureaucracy has tried to ignore us, things like that. But uh, otherwise, um, otherwise, uh, no, I, I don't think I ever thought that I want to give up and go away. I mean, there was no place to go. This is my home. Right. So. Okay, at this point, I think um, I'd, like so, to invite, I'd like to, can you hear me, Bablu? Yes, yes, I can. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt, but I, I just mm. want to invite the other panelists to come in also. There are many, many questions here, Bablu, and uh, I'm, I'm going to let go of the more technical ones because I think those can maybe, can people reach out to you on email to uh, talk about the technicalities of uh, your work? 
but I'd like to invite uh, Mansi and Ketki and Walter Hatli. But do you have questions? Anita, are you still with us? I'm here. Yeah, and Prithvi is also with us. So yeah. let's open it up to the panel and then so that we can open it up to the whole audience. We won't be able to take everybody's questions. Yeah. But like yeah. So, so I have a question, Bablu. It was definitely a very inspirational talk because the kind of area that you're covering, it's really mind boggling. So I have a question that how, have you defined the land use for the project land? Like say lands for agriculture, lands under a forest or lands under grasslands? Means if any such kind of uh, no, division no. Made, division. we have been using we have been using the the government data so okay. we we have ourselves not done anything we have used hmm. the government data for that. okay so you went by the ownership status of uh, these lands means how did you yes. approach that means say for example for agriculture for i'm sure uh, all these farmers are using their private land, but when it comes to grassland restoration, so how did you approach that? No, like you, you I, I missed that that part. What you said, the farmers have their wetland. Yeah, so what is yeah, so I'm just asking that how did you define the land use in the entire this this big project land? So, like, say, for example, there are agricultural lands where all agricultural produce is coming, but when it comes to ecological restoration of forests and the grasslands, so what if, uh, lands did you use for that? Or is it happening oh, on the this, private lands? This is, no, no. This is all, all revenue wasteland. It's called Perambok land here. It's uh, in hmm. the government records, it's revenue land, but it's called wasteland. And uh, no agriculture is taking place there. Years ago, years ago, the people from these villages, the eight, nine villages that we, who are actually protecting this uh, land, they used to do agriculture here. They used to do the old type of agriculture where they used to just scatter the millet seeds and then take, uh, because the forest was cut down. You know, we had the forest here really had the dwarf teak, Hardwickia binata, was the main, main tree of this place here. And uh, then it was all cut down because the Madras Gudur line uh, needed, um, needed uh, wood for the tracks, the sleepers. And so wood was transferred, transported from here all the way to Madras. There's a village here called Teklodu where all this teak and hardwickia is to be loaded into the train to go to Madras. And uh, the rest of it was just, just thrown away. And then we had the Mufasil town expansion uh, that took place. And all this wood went into the growth of the Mufasil towns. So when we came here, all these hills were bare in 1990. This is a reserve forest. What you see behind me in the hills, that those hills were, were our reserve forest and they did not have any vegetation. So in, 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 today, of course, this is, is vegetated because we protected this whole seven, it's about 700 acres of land. This belongs to the forest department and we have been protecting this. Whereas the Kalpavali program, which I talked about the larger program, that is about uh, 7,000 odd acres in one uh, area. That is revenue wasteland, which we have been protecting and revitalizing. Yeah. Does so that answer that's your question? Wonderful. Yeah, yeah, surely. So, yeah, yeah that's really nice that. Uh, it's a very nice combination of uh, all these things, like along with the sustainable livelihoods, you're also doing forest restoration and grassland restoration. So nothing best mix of uh, like the land uses that you have, wherein there is a, a space for both human beings, non-human beings, and it is uh, 
catering to the needs of this both wonderful yeah so we we have only just recently begun to work on wildlife as well okay uh, along with my my daughter and her partner who mm. himself is a wildlife ecologist and he okay. brought in the concept of wildlife we had not worked on wildlife before and okay. uh, they have done a lot of research into this and and they have introduced the wildlife concept into our work just recently mm. about 4 5 years ago yeah it would be really nice to do documentation of all this maybe if you yeah. could just do before and after come come over like. and do it sure we wish to come we've been hearing about this project since so long Yeah, thank you so much you're welcome well yeah so manisha so i have had one more one question, question for babu so uh, babu firstly it was so nice to hear from you and i just like the name timbuktu i think uh, i just saw the other video and it says that it's the horizon where earth and sky meet so that's a wonderful uh, name you have chosen and uh, i i think after we speak people would also like to hear it from you that how you chose this name so if you could elaborate uh, the question i have is how this restored land is helping in your agriculture uh, work or in the uh, for the villages so uh, that would be a very nice uh, thing to know because then the agriculture and the restored land which now has a combination of uh, restored grasslands and forest so people would be able to know how the connections are there between agriculture and the you know, forest because nowadays what is happening is the people are giving uh, up on forest and restoration for making land for agriculture so how these two things are going hand in hand if you have documented anything if you have uh, seen all these things there would like to know about that well, interesting question and very very important you know um unfortunately our documentation has been rather bad but i can introduce you to to one of my colleagues uh who is this ecologist and he can uh, he he may be able to help you out where documents are concerned uh, so his name uh, is siddharth not, rao okay but not the documentation part i am asking is the uh, how it has helped agriculture say by uh, yeah. maybe by uh, having some yeah. ground water recharge or anything or some other resources that people might be using from forest so something like that yeah the first lesson that uh, oh, we learned was that agriculture is not possible without forests uh anybody who is doing agriculture without any relationship to forests or without to grasslands or to wilderness is is doing it with the use of other resources like chemicals or whatever uh without biomass you can't do real agriculture and without this interrelationship between the wilderness and the ag uh, agriculture cannot really happen uh so you have places which are river right so that is a very different area in the grassland situation in a uh, our kind of uh, area we have to have forests this is the first lesson that we learned so the first thing i started doing in 1990 was to start agriculture and uh, within a year or two i came to understand that there was no way anything is going to grow here because the land is almost dead so how do we heal this land healing of the land is done by the forest the healing is done by the animals the healing is done by nature herself and uh, so we began to look at the hills around us and we said we must start to regenerate this forest 
and we must try to protect this land. And if we don't, then uh, the forest will never come back here because we just can't go around planting trees, which is the stupidest thing. You can't keep planting trees on slopes above 25 degrees. It's crazy. How do you water them? How do you look after them or anything? And phenomenal stuff is that all you have to do is protect that piece of land and nature is, is able to regenerate herself with a little bit of help here and there. And all that you see around here is regeneration and nature being able to do her job successfully. But what happened? In Timbuktu, we had we hit water in 1991. We did our first bow well. I got a very famous uh, geologist here, extremely famous. He has passed away. And he came here and he said, Bablu, you either sell this land or um, just leave it because there's no way you guys are going to even be able to live on this land. I said, why? He said, there's no, there's no water here. There's no way that you're going. There's a, there are these black rocks here and these are vertical dike systems. So there is no water flow. You can't live here. Then I went to Anandpur and I got some geologists. They took their machines, went around, they searched for water and they couldn't find water. So I had an old friend who I'd made friends with, um, who supported the union in, 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 in a village called Pedapalli nearby. He was a school teacher. So I, he used to go and divine water with this copper rock. So I asked him, can you please come to Timbuktu and have a look? I, you know, we need to have water, otherwise how will we live? So he went around bare feet with this copper wire going up and down. And then he said, okay, drill the bore well here and you'll get water. So we drilled and sure enough, there was water. But we, we hit water at 60 feet below ground level. This is in 1991. And uh, we drilled about 100 feet and we hit water at 66 feet. And by 1995, the water table there was at 18 feet. And this is all because regeneration had begun to happen. We didn't do anything. We did a lot of earthworks, of course, you know, on this 32 acres of land, we did a lot of earthworks. We did swales, we did you know, we are trained permaculturists, so we did a lot of uh, water and soil conservation works on the land. And on the stream, which is a rain-fed stream, we built a couple of check dams. That's it. And the rest was done by nature. So from, from 66 feet, it had come up to 18 feet. And then we had five years of almost no rains the last five years and that's when water table even in this area began to recede and we we redrilled the bore well up to 380 feet because we were looking for water and then we had one rain in october that one rain revived the whole water table and we were back to normal So if you have done your work properly, you have been able to do your earthworks properly, then rain, you know, the, the best place to save water is under the ground. So if you're able to get the water to go into the ground, then half the job is done. And uh, if we are able to reforest, and even if in our lands, if we can keep 30% of our land only for forest, again, half the job is done. We have to grow lands on our agricultural lands. There's no two ways about it. Every field bund must have trees. We may be able to cut down those trees during the agricultural season, means cull those trees, and then they will come back again. So you plant those kind of trees that, that do well on, on, on cutting. And then you get biomass and that biomass is extremely important for agriculture. I hope that answers your question. 
Uh, the forests yes, yes. have to be supported. The forests have to be looked after. Without the forest, we will not be able to regenerate water. Right. That's true. And that, that's very important to note that the relation of agriculture and forest is firstly, it's connected through water and then the biomass, as you mentioned. So that's really good uh, effort. Uh, I had one more question that you had mentioned but about is, ecological rights but, of children. Yeah. Yeah. But there is one more thing before you ask me the question. Is this conflict between wildlife and, and human beings? Again, we have to create spaces where the wildlife can retreat into. Because if they don't have those spaces, they will come into the human areas and there will be more and more conflict. And that's one other very important reason why forests and wilderness should be, should be kept and, and protected. Yeah, sorry. Certainly, yeah, question. that's very important point you mentioned. So, yeah, so the question was, what are ecological rights of children you mentioned in your presentation. So I was really curious to know that uh, this term is uh, very new, that uh, some children could have ecological rights. So could you explain that? Actually, children have many rights. Ecological rights is just one of them. If you go to the Child Rights Convention, uh, uh, children have the right to participate. Children have the right to health. Children have the right to uh, protection. Children have the right to good food. And uh, India is one of the signatories of this, this uh, document. And one yes. of them is ecological rights because the children are, are, are the future. They are going to inherit the earth. And uh, so they have a right over uh, ecology of this area. And if we as adults are destroying the ecology, they have the right to protest. And not only protest, but also do something constructive. So our work with the children has been to make them aware that it is their rights and that the adults and the older people cannot just go on doing whatever they want to do. So they have the right to protest. They have the right to do something also constructively. Like they can plant trees, they can protect places, they can do, you know, learn agriculture, they can learn how the way the birds and the bees work and get to appreciate nature and appreciate the ecology around them. So when there is something negative being done, they are able to protest and say, please don't do this. Uh, basically making them aware because there's a lot of, lot of lack of awareness among our people, I must say, and people with whom I have been working. Um, it, it's, it's really interesting because, you know, till a few years ago, till, well, even when I came, plastic was almost non-existent. I mean, there was plastic. But everything used to be made, including, you know, like housing, for example, the floors, the walls, uh, everything used to be made from, from locally available materials. And all of it was, the type of material was uh, biodegradable. So what they cooked at home uh, was given to the animals. All the waste went to the animals. Where, from where it went into the, into the compost pits, you know, farmyard manure, and that was taken and put into the field. And, you know, that's how they did the agriculture. But when the plastic started coming in such a big way, somehow people are not aware that by throwing away this plastic cover, like you throw away a, a banana peel, that plastic cover is not going to uh, degrade. Somehow it's just not got into the head of most of the people. And uh, after doing massive amounts of 
of uh, awareness building, little bits and pieces is beginning to go in, you know. Uh, but for the children, it's very fast. They are able to catch the idea extremely fast. And uh, then they become the advocates. They start talking about it at home. They start talking it about it among themselves. And as they grow up, the awareness level grows. And when they know that they have a right, you know, otherwise the children all over, not just the villages, huh? all over, even the urban areas, children are not taught that they have rights. They are just people who have to listen. They have to listen to what has to be, you know, they don't have the right to, to say anything. Uh, we are trying to get them to to say. All right. I don't Sunita know. That has a, Sunita yeah. has a question, maybe. Uh, Sunita, can you share? Yeah, sure. Okay, Bablu, this is my first full-fledged Zoom session, and it's uh, wonderful to be with you here today. Um, I have two quick questions. Um, one is, you know, I've just been looking at your own trajectory from the very heady, uh, you know, days of the 70s and 80s with the Young India Project being quite the revolutionary, um, you know, a Marxist. Uh, I remember you in, uh, in Bordi in 1990 you know, being so outspoken and uh, full of uh, very, um, you know, kind of strong ideas and views. Um, there must have been, you know, some amount of uh, anger as well against the system, mm -hmm. naturally. Uh, you've come a long way. And, uh, you know, it's, it's just wonderful to see the sort of synergy that has come about with bringing together um, both urban and rural uh, human resources. You speak of social capital, and I see this capital coming from both quarters. And what you and your team has done is, is building this bridge. And I think we just all need to be looking at how to build bridges wherever they are. And the question I have, Bablu, is through your own journey over the last you know, 42 years and more, uh, what is the core essence? What is the mother seed that has traveled with you throughout that has been your companion, apart from Mary, of course, who is the mother, and, mother of mother seeds? Yeah. <laughs> Never thought of it like this, Sunita. I'm just thinking. I have to think about this. Well, one thing is definitely my my faith in people, and uh, and then learning to have faith in. In, in nature. Uh, I, I have a great faith in people somehow. I mean, for, I don't know what reason, but it's, it's always there. And the other thing I think an extremely important part is, is the, a kind of nationalism. Not the kind of nationalism that we are seeing in today's India but that I must do something for my country and for my people. And, uh, and I, I, I should be able to live what I preach. So, yeah, that, th this, this has been an extremely important part of my, my journey in trying to not just be an intellectual, not just think about change as an intellectual occupation. Myself not change, but change the rest of the people. So it, that has been an extremely important part of my thinking where I have tried to, we have tried to actually do everything that we have asked the people to do. Every program that we have asked, we ourselves in our personal lives have, have tried to, you know, this house that, that we live in is made with natural material, the clothes that we wear, the food that we eat, you know. And even within the organization, we have 
uh, we have a cooperative within the organization which does alternative banking. We, we eat and grow organic food. So, you know, everything, we run a small school and our children are, themselves have, 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 have always lived a different kind of life. So, yeah, I, I guess that would be the, the principle of that idea. I don't know if that answers your question, but that's what I think I'm doing. Hello, people around? Yeah, yeah. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, yeah, that was good to hear. And uh, the other thing I wanted to ask you or share actually with you is, Bablu, you've always said, and especially in the times when I've met you with, you know, groups, groups of young people, and we've sung together, I'll never forget this, and I carry this always with me. You know, you've said, hey, you know, if you can sing, you're okay, wherever you are, whatever it is. And we are in the middle of a really extraordinary time globally here. So, Bablu, what's one of your evergreen songs? And can we, on this whatever Zoom webinar, uh, hear your lovely baritone, please? Because I know time is probably running out. Manisha, That's you're a fantastic here. idea, Sunita. We would love to hear you sing. Yeah. <laughs> really? Yeah. Because, I, I, come on. That's yeah. so great that you brought you that up. You guys are crazy, man. I have not I'm done not this crazy, for years. Man. I've what? been three and a half months on my own in the forest, living down this COVID thing, and how much I've sung to myself and the dogs and whistled and, you know, thought of what you've told us. So come on, you have to give us a song, Bablu. I think, I think Bablu, you, uh, you told me that you had, we had to be mad to be able to do work like this. So maybe this is a mad request, but it's definitely a request from the heart. So we would love to hear you sing. And, you know, as long as you have time, we have time and we are, we are happy to be here for a longer time. So please, can you sing? Us. Certainly, okay. yes. We can yeah. join how, how, how many people are in this call? There are about 161 of us. Okay. So I need to ask all... <laughs> I need to ask all 160 of you permission to have a smoke because I've not had a smoke and that's, it's really getting on my nerves. Okay. So I need to have a nicotine break. Okay. You, so while, while, while you take your while break, um, Bablu, we'll just, we have a couple of uh, admin things to do. We're going to run uh, two more polls. So Bablu, we can take a five minute break. And people don't go away because after this, we're going to open it up and you can talk to Bablu directly. That is after he has sung the song. So just bear with us. I think Ashwini, can we uh, run the poll? Um, the third and the fourth poll, that would be nice. So uh, this is just a question for all of you. We are thinking of starting Revive for the youth. And I'm very happy to uh, share with you that we have with us today, uh, Mehek Malhotra, who's here. Uh, Mehek, can we see you? Ashwini, please, can you spotlight her? And uh, Mehek Malhotra, she has agreed. I don't know, I don't think she knows what she's stepping into, but she has agreed to help us uh, run, host, organize, uh, revive youth for 15 to 25 year olds. So uh, we just wanted to know from you how many of you are in that age group or have children in that age group. Would you be interested in something like this? So Ashwini, can we run the poll now? The poll is on, Manisha. All right, okay. Also, there's a question here which says that what if we say yes, but we aren't younger than 25? That's fine. As long as you feel young, you're, you're happy to have you join. I think the idea here is for, uh, for us to not just be speaking to the converted or to talk just to each other, but to really see if we can reach out to the youth, especially during this time, uh, the youth, uh, as all of us, uh, there seems to be 
a fair amount of uh, feeling of being lost or confused. So I just felt it would be good that we started talking to them. So that's for that. I just want to share with you also our poster. That's what it might look like. And once we're done with this poll, Ashwini, we'll do the next one. Yes. I'm ready whenever you are. Okay, two more minutes, Pablo. Just we'll just come back to. Are you thinking of the song you're going to sing? I I only know only a few songs fully. So okay. I, I know what I'm seeing. Okay, just give us a few more minutes. I think we can stop this one here, Ashwini, and then run the next poll. The next question is, uh, are any of you interested, willing, would you like to volunteer with us? And we have your email addresses, so we will reach out to you with possible opportunities. I just want to say that uh, all these revived talks have been completely free. They have been managed by a group of volunteers from EcoExist and from other organizations like Kisan. And we've been very grateful to have that voluntary support. We would like to continue doing this. Um, so it'd be great to have volunteers with different skills so we can keep it going. So, And then when we reach out to you, we'll just send you a short questionnaire of the kinds of skills you'd like to offer and also uh, if any of you have ideas of whom we can invite to speak, people that might have inspired you, we're uh, most happy to take suggestions and reach out to them. Also, just addressing to the YouTube viewers, if you would like to volunteer with us, then you can mail us. Yeah, you can um, look us up on our website uh, and, and contact us through there. So if you are watching us on YouTube, uh, that's one way to do it. Okay, I think we can stop poll now, Shwini, please. Great. Okay, Bablu, are you ready? Yeah, some of my old friends have heard this song many times. So I'll sing it. Okay, hang Those on. Those of you... Ashwini, can you spotlight him, please? Those of you who understand Telugu, of course, you'll know what it means. This is a very old song in Telugu, possibly over 400 years old. Uh, it talks about the color black. <laughs> I'll sing only one song and it's going to be in Telugu. Those who want to hear me be sing in Bengali will had to meet me some other time. I think your okay. sister wants to sing with you, Bablu. Munia is your sister. <laughs> Can we spotlight her? Munia she, is your video on. Hang on. She is, she is a fantastic singer. She's a trained singer. Should, so, we, have, oh. should we have her join you? Uh, do you know a song that both of you can sing together? Or we can do that next? Some other time. Okay. I don't think uh, I know even, I mean, she knows hundreds of songs, but she doesn't know the songs I sing. So. Okay. So you go ahead, Bablu, and then we'll come to her. Okay. Nalupu nalupani eru, nalupu nalupani eru, nalupu nalupani Nalupu Narayana Rupe Kada 
okay this song is about about dark about the color black why do people laugh at the color black and uh, you know that's the color of narayana that's the color of the neck on shiva and uh, you know the the sun may be red in color the stars may be white in color but that which looks at them is black in color so why do people laugh at the color black uh, the paddy paddy grain is is uh, red in color the 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 paddy grass is green in color but why at the sickle that that cuts the grass is is black in color so why do people laugh at the color black beautiful and the cow may be red in color the 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 milk amrutam may be white in color but the pot into which the milk is milked is black in color so why do people laugh at the color black so that's the song basically yeah i learned it from a blind man uh a blind chap who who used to sing on the on the trains and buses so i learned this song from him many many years ago nalapo nalapani eru nalapo nalapani eru nauveru janulella nalapo narayana rupe kada o nalapo nalupani nauveru janulella nalapo narayana rupe kala chukkalu telu paina chukkalu telu paina surudu eru paina chuseti nayanalu nalupe kada o nalupo nalupani nauveru janulella nalupo narayana rupe kala aulu yeru paina aulu yeru paina amrutam telu paina pinde di dutalo nalupe kala o gerudu ganga puramu shivudu darinchina nila varna po kalwa nalupe kala vari ma vari maadi pasadaina vari maadi pasadaina vari enlu eru paina koseti koda vallo nalupe kala o nalupu nalupani nauveru janulella nalupu narayana rupe kala yeah that's it <laughs> so everybody is clapping and clapping on everybody we have lovely thank you yeah. lovely beautiful yeah you should also sing one bengali song i think are baba munya <laughs> <laughs> is here with us munya you want to say something how has it been to have a brother like like bablu um i if i start uh, then i don't think i'll end i'll take more time than bablu has taken uh, to talk about my brother i <laughs> maybe i'll start crying after this so <laughs> you have to excuse me i'm so sorry <laughs> you know when he was small and i used to learn music uh, i had a teacher coming home and uh, uh, bablu would listen you know i mean he was also very small at that time but then you know his grievance was after that that you know my parents did not have a teacher to tell me to come and teach me music and uh, you know i mean everything was done for didi why is that you know <laughs> and uh, if i had learned singing that is if he had learned singing that's what he says he would be a much much better singer than i was or i am so <laughs> i'm sure he would be i'm sure he would be but whatever he is doing now is just fantastic i never imagined 
the year we got married, I got married in 78 and Bablu was there, waited so that I get married and then he left and that's it. He left and that was his life after that. So we were, we were very concerned at that point of time that what is happening, don't know where he is, what he is doing, but uh, well, that is what he did. You know, and then now whatever he is, I'm so, so, so proud of, proud of him. My mother is sitting here, my husband is here, and uh, I think all of us are just enjoying hearing him. And so glad that you people have put him up now uh, in the forum. And uh, he is, he is just too good. And my sister-in-law is, is, uh, I mean, I can't think of any words to tell about her. She's the sweetheart uh, to me. And uh, she she's the one who actually brought Bablu also in line, you know, sort of, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise the man was going haywire many a times, you know. So she yeah, brought back him in the, in the line and there she is standing behind him in the line. Oh, Thank you so goodness. much. Thank you so much, you people. I. I wish I can help you in any way, uh, but uh, all the best to the work that you are all doing. Thank you so much. Thank Thanks. you so much. Yeah, I'm Bye. so glad that you were here and that the family is there. And I, we would really love to have a word from Mary also, because uh, Bablu is telling us, Mary, that actually you are his, his secret. So, so... So lovely to see you, Mary. And if we can hear from you a little bit, that would also be great. Oh, hi. Nice to hear, to hear from you. One, what shall I uh, say? Anything specific? Anything, any question or? Mm. Maybe, maybe, Mary, you can tell us what's happening now. Some of the people have had this question, like how have y'all coped with this whole crazy COVID crisis? And are you, um, is, are, is your work getting tested during this time? I mean, are the cooperatives able to uh, hold together? Like how do you, because a crisis is when you really see how strong the, the work is. So can you share with us, Mary? Mm. Yeah, it actually was uh, uh, very uh, uh, difficult <laughs> and complicated uh, because you know the the whole uh, center of our work is uh, come together, you know, get together, meet together, and now we have to tell like distance, distance, you know, right. keep away. <laughs> so and uh, uh, so that is basically like you know, like there's a lot of uh, asking people to move, you know, and. Uh, but uh, it is a very difficult time, uh, <coughs> definitely. But I think it is more difficult in the cities uh, than in the villages. I think it is, uh, there is still more of uh, uh, spaces, even physical spaces available, fresh air comparatively, and fresh food, uh, again, comparatively. Uh, but it is not easy also because in terms of healthcare, you know, if something happened, facilities wise, it is not that, uh, you know, uh, confidence uh, giving. So work wise, of course, it has been very, uh, I mean, the, the cooperatives were like really cool. Like they were like so stable, like even three months gap the women's cooperative, you know, three months gap, and now they are coming up and paying for last three months together because they really own it so much. So they are not, uh, the cooperatives are very stable. There's no issues with that. But the organic, the, the processing unit, you know, in terms of people to come or to do the work and keeping the work going with all the protocols, you know, it is very, very difficult, you know. It is very difficult to to remember, keep remembering, and uh, to get people to follow the protocols and do the work. That is uh, 
kind of well the cooperative the farmers cooperative is taking a beating financially because we've lost <clears throat> we've lost quite a few tons of peanuts because they went rancid and uh, they you know they had to be stored and we don't use chemicals for storing so they've gone rancid and we were not able to send it out to the shops and all that so financially yeah uh, you know we will need working capital we are in in really quite a difficult situation now and another thing was while uh, trying to keep our work going which i think is going quite stable now uh, though there are still uncertainties uh, but what we did also was a large amount of relief work you know uh, both for uh, there were uh, quite a lot of migrant labor in this uh, in our big villages who have been employed in various subsidiary industries of certain main companies that have come into the area so we did uh, quite a lot of relief work before they were able to leave you know before they um, the time they were stuck and we are also we were also able to contribute to this whole people walking uh, at that time you know that is mid may the migrant onward. workers the migrant workers who are yeah. walking through the highway from bangalore to the north of bihar jharkhand or oh, no wherever this young people walking so that time we were able to like in terms of providing food and support and that we were able to do and besides what we did was we did a quick survey of the people in our villages who have either returned from different area and who were impoverished or who were because of this whole lockdown who were affected for food and you know immediate care so this kind of support of course through the uh, with the help of the cooperatives but uh that was also we were balancing both being able to, you know doing some amount of relief work and also keeping our regular work going great i think a lot of people uh, are asking how they can help how they can connect with you we still have people waiting to speak to you and uh, i am going to open it up so and i and i hope that both of you mary i hope you can stay for a, a few minutes and and answer together with pablo because there are many questions here but i think one overall question that everyone wants to know is how can we from wherever we are help with the work that's going on in timbuktu <coughs> go i don't know <laughs> we will at some point in time i think uh, they, we are still looking at it but the 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 support that is is, is financial support because uh, the cooperatives will need uh, working capital this year thankfully the rains have been great and so uh, by the last cropping plan about 11000 acres are being seeded right at this point in time so if the rains continue the way they are continue we are going to have at least 1500 to 1600 tons of food that has to be procured from the member farmers and for that we need working capital and then our machinery in the processing center is over 10 years old and we need to replace the machinery and we've lost a lot of capital under this covid uh so we will need replenishing and uh, you know to ask the farmers to put in any more money because we are working with only very small holder farms we will need support i must tell you that this is how our friends supported right in the beginning when we start when we started the uh, the farmers cooperative we wrote a letter to some of our friends and within a month we had raised about 28 lakhs uh with which we actually constructed the 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 uh, processing center and over the years we have received up to um up to 1 crore 
from friends both in terms of loans soft loans and uh, some amount of uh, grants from our friends so that's how we've been able to develop all these cooperatives and all that because we got this support so i guess that in the near future we will be asking for financial help soft loans would be good the screen is gone dark now what do i do um because the signal here because says it's okay because you sang a song on the value of dark so your screen goes dark <laughs> <laughs> okay i think if i don't yeah, let people yeah. speak now they're going to kill me so i'm opening it up and we will take uh, questions one by one uh, please be patient everybody and we'll uh, we'll invite you the first person i'd like to talk if he is still here is uday andhare he's an architect from ahmedabad and he has some questions about the organization of the of the work let me just i think he's probably fallen off uh Hemant Ghorpade has been waiting for some time. If he's still here, Hemant, would you like to speak? Hemant Ghorpade. I think there's a time lag between. Uh, Okay, I'm just going to open it up then. I'm um, starting with Divya Bharti. Divya, can you hear me? Can you speak? This is also because it's the phone. So if there are messages coming in, blanks. What happened to the? Yeah. It's very slow. For some reason, I'm not. Mm -hmm. Ujwala Shivade, Hemant Ghorpade, Divya Bharti. <coughs> Divya. Hemant, you, you, we can hear you if you'd like to say something. Yes, uh, I would like to ask that uh, how this is uh, how how you keep yourself motivating in this work. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> so it is. <laughs> Go ahead. I think it's about uh, it's about love. Okay. Uh, like you know if you when you love something like i don't mean a person but uh, you love what you do or you, you invest in it you then are uh, committed to that and you feel responsible for that and you it is not just investing in that uh, you know investing sense but it is it's investing oneself you know so then the motivation just flows i think okay thank you thank you divya would you like to go next you have to unmute yourself divya can get your thing you there are loads of questions here there are around 71 questions um bablu and uh what we are going to do is to also uh, copy paste the questions onto an email and send them to you along with the email addresses and see if 
people want to reach out to you directly because for some reason uh, this is not working here. Divya, would you like to pose your question? Shall I go? Yes, please go ahead. It's me, Rekha here. Yes. Uh, it, this question is for Babli Garu. Uh, I want to know um, well, what has uh, inspired you to shift from agitation politics to constructive work? <laughs> <laughs> I was I was quite uh, quite tired. I mean, twelve years of doing agitational politics, um, and then finding that the that no real change is happening was difficult. And uh, by then, I had also come across uh, Gandhi, and. Uh, I, we also realized that, uh, at least I realized that, you know, I was into agitation, fighting against the system, but I was not part of the system. I had never been part of the production process myself. So I said that I should get into the production process in some form, and then from within try to, to fight. And of course, agriculture was the, <coughs> the most basic, the most basic form of production. And so I said, you know, let's get into agriculture and then I can start uh, doing work from there. But the land taught me some very different things. Basically, that's how I went into the politics of dissent. Because uh, I'm not saying, I mean, agitation politics is extremely important. We have to. People have to fight for the rights and agitate and, you know, do all that. That is extremely important. But there is another aspect in fighting. And that aspect is, is, the, is the politics of dissent, in which you do things and show that it is possible to do and create things that is the kind of future that one wants. Uh, and that is constructive work. And so there are lots of people who have written about it and uh, lots of people who have done it. So we thought that we should get into that and just do and show people the new kind of world, the different kind of world that we are looking for. And that's how we moved into more construction uh, constructive work. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. You're welcome. Ujwala, would you like to go next? You have to unmute yourself. Hello? Yes, Ujwala. Oh, it was just that it was a wonderful session and we were trying to clap after the singing. <laughs> okay. Pablo and Mary, I think this is a phenomenal, absolutely wonderful story. And I, I'm, I'm sure there are a lot many people who would like to see this replicated in other parts. And 40 years is something, man. That I'm is about, I'm about phenomenal. Absolutely brilliant. I hope we can you you can hear us clap <laughs> and to eco exist also for getting you here. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. Thank you. Aishwarya, would you like to say something? You have to unmute yourself. Yeah. Yes. Uh, am I audible? Yeah. Yes. Uh, Atma Namaste, sir. Uh, my question is, if you could, you know, enlighten us as to how does one change maker unite an entire team as one and work for a unidirectional goal? I have to hold a workshop for this. <laughs> <laughs> how, I mean, if you are motivated, I guess...
people around you also are motivated they get motivated and like i said if we are able to live our lives uh live our lives so that we don't just preach but then we also make changes in our own lives <coughs> then i guess it motivates people the other thing is to i guess we also you know 90% of the people who are working in the collective are local people they are local boys and girls who know the problems of this area and when they start working on solutions for the problems that they have grown up with i think they also get quite motivated but then yes it's it's a process it's, it's a whole long process it doesn't happen automatically or the kind of organization we set up the kind of discussion forums that we set up all that leads to a kind of sense of motivation i guess anything you want to say not just you we can have we have a question from pantangi ram babu yeah ji ram babu hello hello good evening gangoli sir good evening i am from hyderabad i am a journalist writing on agro ecology okay. from uh, sakshi i am working with sakshi telugu daily for last 13 years i have been writing for last 6 years uh, uh, i am producing sagobadi page and main edition in sakshi telugu daily you might have seen those pages some of those pages yes yeah actually uh, i want to uh, come and meet you personally uh, mm. uh, here uh, uh, please uh, accept my hearty congratulations to you you are doing wonderful regenerative work uh, all together but my question is the ap government is uh, promoting natural farming community based natural farming uh, is there any uh, possibility uh, you are thinking to connect with those uh, network for the benefit of your farmers what is happening yeah well what do you think that question is to you you can answer the question to answer to me question to me because you are running the project so no the question is to you okay um yeah so all those who want to ask questions you must direct those questions to me or to mary mary doesn't answer questions that are directed only to me okay. so <laughs> so in this case yeah we are we are ever ready to cooperate with uh, with the the government of andhra pradesh okay. we know that they started this whole whole thing of zdnf which the name of course has changed uh, a bit uh, they know about our work because yeah. we we were the first ones to start doing this work and have been doing this for many years mm-hmm. uh, um, and we have hosted we have co-hosted uh, uh, mr palekar mr palekar's uh, workshops here Uh, mm. more than 5000 farmers have come and listened so we are not strangers to mr palekar and his work <coughs> but we were doing all this before palekar was talking about it and wow. uh, and the government of ap knows what we have been doing for all these years palekar but they they haven't approached us yet and uh, we continue doing what we are doing if they want to cooperate with us of course they are most welcome oh uh, not they have contacted to start a uh, cluster sir all those things? no they have In not contacted area. us no no ah, they ah, haven't ah. So <clears throat> they have in fact come and started uh, working in our villages asking the farmers who are part of the cooperative to join with their work which okay. again we have told our farmers that they should join and they should go and do that work because it's a good program there's no problem in that yeah you have on these things okay. Babu, so i just discovered that two of my very dear friends are on the chat you know them chitra and vishwanath 
Oh. From Bangalore. Thank you. Uh, and I think Chitra, Chitra uh, has something to say. Oh. Yeah. Bablu, you people Hello, are, Chitra. Uh, we look up to the kind of work you do. I know we do it in the urban space. Vishnu does it with the cooperative, at, not the cooperative, the NGO at Mulbagal on water. Uh, and I, 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 my question is probably not for the book, but about why is this place called Timbuktu? Timbuktu is the earth heaven, which we learned a lot about it from our studies on earth. So just need to know why are you calling it? Well, uh, you know, when we were working, organizing the agricultural laborers, etc. Yeah. Both Mary and I used to go off to the villages every day. Hmm. So our children were very little at that time. And every time we had to ask, we had to answer, where are you going? Why are you going? What are you doing? Etc. before leaving in the morning. So, well, at some point, it became very difficult to answer every question. So we started saying that we are going to Timbuktu. Okay. And uh, once they knew that we are going to Timbuktu, then they stopped asking those questions. We just had to say Timbuktu. They say, okay, you're going to Timbuktu. Okay. So then when we bought this land, and uh, we had big ideas, uh, big, big names that we wanted to give it. Center for Ecological Restoration and things like that. So one day while we were discussing this whole thing, Mary said, <clears throat> look, we've been going to Timbuktu all these years. Why don't we call this place where we want to now set our roots down? Why don't we call it Timbuktu? And so that's how we named the place Timbuktu. It's only much later we came to know that it actually exists in the Telugu dictionary and it says Sarihaddurekha. Oh. Sarihaddurekha means uh, where the earth meets the sky, the last horizon, right? Oh, that's very interesting. So that's probably the meaning for the city in Mali too. Okay. Yes, yeah. Uh, well, I don't know that, but... Uh, it, that is why Jonathan Swift mm -hmm. coined the word Timbuktu, mm -hmm. Timbuktu actually, meaning as this nowhere, nowhere land, okay. which it was, mm -hmm. yeah. it, which it, it was, you know, because the first time they heard of Timbuktu was sometime in the ninth century. Yeah, but it was a center of learning and that, that and they discovered much later. Okay. But it took them something like 600 years to find Timbuktu. Oh. By the time they actually discovered Timbuktu, it was in ruins. Mm -hmm. It was the last bastion of black African uh, Islamic culture. Yeah, and uh, uh, yeah, it was the Nalanda of the East, of the mm -hmm. West. Yeah. You still and, have uh, and, and it had it, it, their, their, their architecture was supposed to be something Armanisha really phenomenal. Yeah. 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 I've concept. been to Kano, so I've seen those kind of structures. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, and I don't want to take more time for this. Yeah. We should meet up, Chitra and Vishwanath. Yeah, we've been, we've been meaning to come, so I think yeah. back on two months, we'll be there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay, there are two more questions, one from Lakshay and another from Ankur, who are waiting to talk. Lakshay, please go ahead. Namaste, sir. Namaste. Sir, my name is Lakshay Kapoor and uh, I am a student of Social Entrepreneurship Program, Transforming India Initiative. So, mm -hmm. you talked that uh, the village livelihood collapsed, but the agriculture survived. So, can you please tell me uh, why and how? Why and how? Yes, sir. Why and how agriculture survived? Why the uh, why other livelihood opportunities they died and collapsed? I would say. Yeah, the, the most important thing is that the <clears throat> the 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 model 
the economic model that we decided to adopt way back in the early 50s and then carried on is a model that is based on urbanization and uh, industrialization. And so long as we carry on in this model, rural entrepreneurship cannot be understood. So it's, it's a problem of the model that we are following. So it doesn't matter which government comes in, which party comes into power, so long as this model of economic development is being followed, we will be going down the same path. So what happened was with these industries coming in and with no focus on rural enterprise and cottage industry and the kind of industry that actually existed in the villages, these huge industrial complexes started to be promoted and financed and research, et cetera, et cetera, was done for that. So what happened in the process was the introduction of material from the outside. So you had the only thing that they were unable to touch properly, they were able to do it also, um, was agriculture because people were actually doing agriculture and that could not be replaced with plastic grain, you know. But the, the bindis could be, the, 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 the water, the pots, all the material that was made with mud could be replaced. All the material that was made with wood could be re replaced. All the animals that used to be part of the production process could be replaced. And it goes on and on. Cloth could be replaced. So, you know, it's like, it's an ironical thing that while the government of India kept supporting the handloom industry in a very weird way, they also promoted the, the mechanized industry. So large mechan mechanical looms uh, started coming into being. And just like the British had tried to, you know, destroy our handloom industry. Our own government destroyed our handloom industry. And, and this is all because of the economic model. I'm not saying that anybody is bad. But if you follow this kind of an economic model, there is no way that you will be able to do anything different. Because capital, the way it is, if we are unable to harness the capital and we allow it to reign free, then the market just takes over. And that's the problem. And that is why all these different manufacturers, different entrepreneurship within the villages, one by one, one by one started to fall apart because, because there was no market for it. That is one. But the other very important thing is the kind of education that our people have been given. Because almost all the young people are first generation schoolgoers, were even at that time. And they began to learn that everything urban, everything industrial, white collar work, blue collar work is much more respectable than farming than living in the village, then working with the mud, with working with cow dung, working with mud, working with wood. It's better to go and work as a watchman in the city than it is to do farming and agriculture related activities. So the culture of agriculture was systematically destroyed without people even realizing that they are destroying it. And a different culture was, was promoted by the education system. So our kids, and that is why we finally, after so many years, figured this out. And we started the School of Farming or School of Agriculture because we realized that the children of the farmers don't know what is agriculture. 
they have grown brought and brought up bought and uh, they have been born and brought up in 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 the villages they are children of farmers and they know nothing about agriculture they don't know how to forget about tilling the land they even when they if they are asked to hold cow dung they say chi you know they are unable to um, mix cow dung cow urine or anything like this because that's what they have been taught my son went to the same school as these people went earlier before we started our own school and when we built our first hut in timbuktu which was made of bamboo walls he looked at that and he was all of i think 6 or 7 years old and he said is this uh, a house this is not a house this is a hut and people don't live in huts they live in house so i asked what does house mean it must have smooth walls it must have be built with cement and it must have a flat roof blah 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 because that's what the school was teaching him and that's what our children from the villages have learned and then the housing program that is given by the government and by many ngos is this cement boxes you know so we have promoted this whole whole culture which is totally anti agriculture if you understand what i'm saying i hope that answers your question okay yeah, i think that was quite uh, illuminating babu uh there meet mr one... this is this is kattappa oh uh, yeah <laughs> um sorry sanskriti menon who uh, is heading the center for environment education maybe you know her she is also with us and she has put up a question that she'd like me to read out uh, she wants to know about the nature of linkages between the work of ecological regeneration livelihoods and economics with the governance decision making processes in the panchayat and gram sabha so is there a link between how decisions are made in the panchayat and the kind of cooperative work that you are doing is it mutually supportive what are the actual topics of discussions and decisions uh is it making is this is the decision making in the gram sabha equity oriented or is it difficult and conflict ridden and have there been changes over time in these processes in the panchayat well sanskriti hello <laughs> on the first i mean most important things is that in andhra pradesh the panchayat raj was systematically destroyed so we don't have we spent i think we spent about 5 years uh training sarpanches literally i mean we have in our working area at that time there was 1001 sarpanches and in that year when we started they they were freshly elected and they were young and the local collector at that time was very enthused by our model when we were training in the villages we used to do awareness programs on you know the panchayat uh what is it called the 73rd amendment and uh and all that i mean we were we were talking about panchayat raj when these elections actually took place and then we went out doing a series of trainings and workshops all across these thousand panchayats but there's no teeth you know the panchayats don't have any teeth like in kerala or in other places the panchayats are totally powerless so of course in our watershed work and all that kind of stuff we have held gram sabhas we you know we have tried to bring the panchayat together and uh, i must honestly say that our organ, our groups or the sanghas that we mobilized and organized and the cooperatives that we formed are outside of this whole process because the panchayat raj the panchayats are so powerless number one and if they are powerful they are the 
the richer landowners and they the the they are they are very much part of the political party politics which is what it should not be but they are part of the political process and we have tried to keep out of that whole political uh, party politics so we had to we had to develop all these things outside of the panchayat unfortunately how it should be is that we organize the panchayats that's how i would suggest people do it that's how i would have done it but i was unable to and we were unable to uh penetrate that because these guys they would the people we work with were socially ostracized they were financially disabled you know so we worked with the poorest people and we had to do this work outside of the panchayat system and anyways the panchayats are so powerless there's nothing that can be done but that's how it should be done i would say wow babu it's been so amazing i think we could keep talking to you there are just still so many questions here and uh, but i think i'm i'm going to wrap up there were just two more people who i promised uh, i would let them speak so if you have a burning question ujwala and ankur maybe we can take one last question and then we will have to let bablu go ujwala you have to unmute yourself if you if you'd like to speak and ankur also if not uh, i think we can wrap up now bablu i don't know how to thank you it's just been i kind of feel like you know every sunday i i have these amazing gatherings in my home <laughs> and and you know it's just so lovely to see you sitting there and and hearing about the story of timbuktu many of But us I didn't, i didn't hear your mother no she was supposed to ask some questions yeah, right? she she got a whole hour with you bablu i think <laughs> now <laughs> she's going to she's going to be upset but i think maybe we can have another call with her i don't know if she's still there or not but anyway thank you for thinking of her mm. yeah i just want to say bablu that you know many of us are dreaming of doing what you have done and to see where 40 years of pursuit brought <clears throat> you i think to me personally it's so encouraging it's inspiring and it's also a reminder that that's what it takes you know this is this kind of change is not something that happens overnight and uh i mean i'm also very uh, happy to hear that your children we haven't spoken much about your children but you did share with me that your children are also getting involved in the work and bringing their skills uh so that's so great to hear because my question is always about the, the the next generation you know and uh and especially the next generation in in the cities because they have no role models like you and mary here you know so i keep wondering what what they are looking forward to and that was why i thought maybe having a i think my mother is here she's not going to let go of her chance so maybe we'll take one last question from my mother if that's okay bablu i have no problem okay namaste to everybody namaste <coughs> i i enjoyed your song because i i don't have one question because i have so many questions so i'll forego this opportunity to ask you a question and mm. in chitra and vishwanath come there i will also come there because i feel together we will have many uh, you know so many so questions so. and answers to give to each other uh, i enjoyed your song i sat through the whole session thank you so much and it was so wonderful to hear mary also yes <laughs> you're most welcome super Yeah, so you must come to Bangalore and we go together. You must come. Yeah. 
So I'm I'm also happy to share uh, while Chitra and Vishwanath are still here, Bablu, that our next speaker is uh, going to be Vishwanath. Oh, good. Yeah, I just want to share the lovely poster we made. Just give me one minute. It was really lovely to have the birds joining in from the behind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we have a lot of birds. So that's our poster for Vishwanath. If Vishwanath is still here, just uh, for the rest of you, I want to say that Chitra and Vishwanath were my seniors when we were studying architecture at the School of Architecture in Ahmedabad. And uh, I, I hold them in very high regard. And I have learned a lot from both of them. So next Sunday, Vishwanath is going to talk to us about water. Uh, he has done path-breaking work, again, like Babdu and Mary, in bringing communities together while talking to them about natural resource conservation. So I really encourage you and welcome you to join us next Sunday. And Bablu, if you and Mary, or if you, if you have the time, it'd be great to have you here too because uh, water in the urban context and water in, in your context is, is very different. It would be good to have the, was that a peacock? Yeah, we have a hell of a lot of peacocks here. Yeah. Great. <laughs> My father. So with that, Bablu, um, thanks again. And I, I do hope that we can stay in touch with all of you somehow somehow connect uh, our little efforts with your work definitely come to timbuktu as soon as the government will allow us to travel again i know mansi and ketki would would love to go uh, and learn because we have so much to learn from both of you so thank you very very much Babu. and thank, thank you to all of you for spending so much time with us. It's been almost three hours, which is uh, the longest we've ever had, but it's been absolutely wonderful. Thank you, Munia, and to the family for joining us. And please thank Mary also, Bablu. On our I basis. will. She had to leave because some work came up, so. Maybe we'll have a whole separate section, uh, a whole separate session with Mary, just listening to her organizational skills and, uh, you know, hearing about all of these initiatives in a, in a deeper way. So I think if you can convince her to come onto the forum, that would be really fabulous. Sure. I think that will be a wonderful idea. Yes, yes. Thank Great. you. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye. Thank Thanks you. Thanks all of you for being Bye, here. Bye, Bye, Mary. Bye, Manisha. Bye.